Massis Foundation. Hello, could I please speak with Naveen Kishore? This is Naveen, Paul. Naveen, it's such a pleasure to have you on the phone now to be part of the quarantine tapes. I'm I'm delighted to, to hear your voice all the way. You're in, in Calcutta now or in Delhi? I'm in Calcutta, very much in Calcutta, right within the crisis, as it were. How would you describe the the crisis um, in Calcutta? And- well, it's a it's a kind of it's 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 as much as anybody else's, I guess. It's both personal, it's collective, which is the way I am. It's not just for myself. There is a feeling of this sort of foreboding and unease, a kind of I think a kind of fracturing, if you get what I mean. You know, I worry about my colleagues, my family, my friends, writers, translators. It's a kind of, uh, you know, one, of course, it doesn't translate into a kind of uh, transmittable anxiety, as in the exterior. My exterior is very matter of fact, even masquerading as calm. But the insides, Paul, they take a lot of constant vigilance to be kind of uh, at, at, at par with a functioning mind. So one is reading, one is doing things around the house, and there is an alertness somewhere that we must survive. So we're working. That's what we're doing. But it's difficult all around us. It's, you know, we are the privileged few who have homes to retreat to and be in a kind of lockdown and a curfew. But there's millions out there who, I don't know if you've seen or heard the the wonderful journalistic work that's happening. Lots of migrations happening suddenly across different states of daily wage earners, people who cannot stay in a particular place because their landlords won't let them because they are no longer earning their daily wage. So we have this strange situation where you're talking of distancing and here there are hundreds of thousands of people Cheek their child marching for 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers. In fact, I suspect the toll is going to be higher than what this virus can expect to take. I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm going no, to no, 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 no. Being um, agitated. No, uh, how can one not be agitated? I want you to say a little bit more about that situation, though I've read a little bit about it. I must mm-hmm. say that so much of the concentration now is on what is happening in the U.S. for us and um, mm-hmm. the way uh, leadership in this country is... Um, is reckoning with this pandemic. And so I'd love to hear yes, more. The, the, thing is, the thing is that it's, it's perfectly all right. It seems to be the thing to do, which is to stop contact with the rest of the world, with the people. But that's, you need to think this through. You need to have given some kind of a warning. You don't make a dramatic flourish and say, in four hours, my countrymen, we will shut down. And that's, that this that's what is, Modi did, right? Th- that's what it did. And, you know, you cannot, you cannot take leave of compassion at a time like this. It cannot all be fear and coercion. If you don't do it for 21 days, the next 21 years are, you know, I mean, this is not the time. And you're working across classes. Right. You're working across literacy levels. You need, people cannot understand the same language. It's not easy, right? 
And there you the are. Pain, yeah. There you are. You know, it's extraordinary how you brought this about because, in a way, you're talking about a social level of mistranslation. You're so interested in translation, and here the government has not translated what needs to be done. Yes, and the irony, of course, a bit for for a different time, though this I'm not sure is the time for it, between translation and migration. Right. The, the, say, the, say something the obvious, about that. The yeah. obvious ba- say something about well, that, because it may not be the right time, but then again, this may be the right time. So it, you know, what I mean is that, you know, this, this whole... You know, we talk about translating from one language to another, one culture to another. Migration is pretty much also something like that, right? Only your life depends on it. So you're leaving, you're being forced to leave. That's the whole thing. It's not the romance of a certain immigrant culture that perhaps your country is built on. But at this particular moment, to be able to not communicate, not find the words to let your fellow countrymen know that yes, this is an absolute necessity, that yes, this is a harsh thing. You can't just apologize and say, I'm sorry for taking this sort of a thing, but this is what I am going to do and this is what. You have to think it through because all of us, you cannot do the kind of rich poor thing here that there's so many of us and that it doesn't matter at the end of the day because you could have, you had enough time from January, we knew that this was happening. You could have said that I'm going to have a lockdown in month March for 21 days or 30 days or 60 days, but give people time, provide them with the way of it all. I know it's tough financially, economically, we're not in a particular state to not everything translates into money and gets to people's pockets or we're not structured like that or, you know, but these are all excuses at a time like this. And I've been preoccupied with this, this, this whole thing, sitting over here, partly impotent, writing in a certain kind of way, not being able to, to, to sort of get out there because I'm supposed to be at a vulnerable age. So it's not easy for family and friends to want you to be there, but you want to be there trying to help, trying to do things, which you do, but how much can you do sitting at home online? in terms of feeding people or wherever you can help them with money. Everybody's doing it, but it's all become that everybody's become a kind of civil society action, right? Governments, state governments are getting into the act. In fact, state governments seem to be doing a lot in Kerala, in West Bengal, in New Delhi now, and Maharashtra. But everybody's floundering. And then again, you could say, yes, the whole world is floundering in a certain kind of way. But, you know, here's, it's, it's very tricky. My thoughts kind of get preoccupied with, with the kind of shortness of life. You know, this, this, this phrase that we often use, life is short, it's, it's uttered without actually measuring the extent of life before pronouncing this particular verdict as truth, as fact, as acceptance to perceive notion of life's shortness. And begin to explore the possibility of the notion that life actually, Paul, is neither short nor unnecessarily long. It is what it is. And we learn to live it. Rather, life lives us. And we, in our shyness, or dare I say fear of life, tend to accept our daily hurtling towards a death comfortably foretold by life. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Perhaps poetry is the answer, but not much uh, assurance in these times, I tell you. I should tell our listeners that I'm I'm speaking with Navin Kishore, who is possibly one of the very greatest publisher in the world today, and certainly one of the extraordinary publishers in India of translated literature. I think. Um, if I'm right, Naveen, um, your house, Siegel Press, trans- Siegel Books, yes. Siegel mm-hmm. Books translates um, 
more foreign literature than just about any other publisher in the world. I think you come in third. And I have had occasion to to visit you in India. And I must say, not only do you choose beautiful, beautiful titles, and but you produce extraordinarily beautiful books, which I'm wondering, you, I'm, I'm wondering in these times from your own, um, your own collection of books, are there some that uh, offering you any solace, or are there any that you can give to to friends now that they need to be uh, apart from each other? Well, okay. it's difficult because I'm reading all the time, and I'm kind of reading sometimes between eight and fourteen books. But I do tend to turn to a certain kind of poetry. Tell me, and a certain kind of nonfiction. And at this moment, I'm. I mean, I have before me a wonderful volume, a huge collected volume called SOS, predictably, by Amri Baraka, which is absolutely wonderful. Why? And I'm reading a lot of Ashbury, a lot of Mervyn, and I'm revisiting all my entire collection of the Hannah Arendt books. And there's a kind of odd one, which I return to again and again in these times, and I think largely because of the lockdown and Kashmir and all of that. I'm reading a book by Robert J. Clifton on Nazi doctors. And I'm currently going through a wonderful volume translation by Anne Carson. It's called Grief Lessons and the whole Euripides thing. Lots of death and blood and murder and bodies. The Greeks, you know, the Greeks fall. Tell me about the Greeks. And <laughs> yeah, but you know how it is. It's a kind of—I mean, my my sense is that it's there's a kind of feeling of grief. It's a kind, you know, it's it's almost akin to that of losing a dear one, perhaps a parent, a sort of impending, uh, you know, something uh, almost Cassandra-like. There's a sense that, of something going wrong. You see. And people often ask us about, uh, oh, but it'll all be normal soon. You just had to hang in there. My point is, do I want to return to a certain kind of normal before this? This is quite a watershed point in everybody's lives. And I think it's going to be tricky, this normal. There is no returning. Whatever state we arrive at will be enabled I don't know what, maybe a different kind of new normal. But will it be normal? Not sure we know. I don't. Again, I mean, if you think a little about what the normal is, we knew it means. The reality of so-called government business partnerships that are titled in favor of the private, the persistent privatization of institutions, you know what I mean, healthcare, insurance, all that. Do we want to go back to that normal? Or do we want in hope, some sort of a much more humanitarian compassion that it will happen, but it will not necessarily happen at the level of governments, the ones that rule. It will happen with you and me, with people. But I don't know. It's, it's kind of difficult at this moment to hope for anything other than a certain easing, because this is not going to go away. This may retreat a little, but this virus is here to stay for the rest of our lives, whatever that means. It, you know, there'll be other things that will take over, but this will reoccur. It will raise its head every now and then, like all the other ones that we have got used to. You were what saying, say? well, Naveen, you were saying it's hard to say at this moment. And of course, one, one cannot really predict how human behavior will change, if at all. Yeah. But if it were to change, mm -hmm. in what way would you hope it would change? What, where does it need to change? Instinctive compassion. Instinctive compassion on I one love, hand. I love that. I love and, that. Instinctive. And a kind of, and a, you know, a kind of, and, and, and I really crave for some kind of a governmental need for a solution at any cost that will reach out to people, anybody, regardless of, you know, differences in wealth. 
I know it all. Everybody is taught of these utopian things, but I think I think I would say that there's an already precarious nature of life for a vast majority, and it cannot be more dire at this moment. So there has to be a larger universal sense, and one would like to hope this happens. It will, it will, but perhaps amongst the people, not necessarily, as I said, those that govern. But this is not new either. The last war is an example, the carving up of the advantages. Once we are safe, we go back to the bartering, the edge. We may hold over weaker others. Who knows? Sorry, I... I I'm getting agitated again. <laughs> you, yes. you, you, you were talking before about the kinds of books you're reading now, and it, yes. brought, it brought to mind a, a wonderful short essay by Susan Sontag on Simon, mm -hmm. on Simon Vale, which really isn't really much about Simon Vale at all. And in mm -hmm. it she says, the truths we respect are those born of affliction. We measure truth mm. in terms of the cost to the writers in suffering rather than by the standard of an objective truth to which a writer's words correspond. Each of our mm -hmm. truths must have a martyr. And I'm wondering if you, if you turn to those books that come from that place. Well, I mean... Uh... I, when I turn to these books, it is, I mean, I'm, I'm not really seeking a particular answer because I don't know what I'm looking for. But the answers, they, they, they sort of swim. You recognize them when they ring a chord, right? It's, that's the important thing. So if I seek a Sontag or I seek a Ramdi Baraka, it's usually some memory that in my head has thrown up the need to look for something, even though I don't know whether it will bring me sort of sort of ideas or or some sort of a creative solution. And usually it does, right? It's it's for a non-believer. This is my exercise in opening the Bible at any page. So yes, uh, that that's a lovely little passage and Sontag, of course, and there's the classic illness as metaphor. And uh, well, there's so many of them then. But again, it's it's the privilege that we are, you and I, surrounded by the protection that books across different cultures offer us, which is why I translate. It is so vital for my self-preservation, for like, as a purely selfish act, to get to know, to read other people. You know, one of the books that, that you've published, that Seagull Press has published, is a book by Nigugi Watyongo uh, called mm -hmm. Secure the Base. And That's right, yes. The, the last um, uh, sentence in one, in, one of the, in one of the chapters reads mm -hmm. like this. In his castigation of colonialism... Césaire admits it is a good thing to place different civilizations into contact with each other. That is an excellent thing to blend different worlds. That whatever its yeah. own particular genius may be, a civilization mm -hmm. that withdraws into itself atrophies, that for civilization exchange is oxygen. And I must say, if I have any hope, and it is a mild hope, uh, it is a mitigated hope, um, but I do hold on to these shards of hope, is that this pandemic will bring about a greater sense of communality. And yet walls are being built everywhere. People are distancing each other now because they have to. But I'm mm -hmm. hoping that that distance um, will change the way we interact with people, our forms of conviviality. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm wondering if you might comment on this, both in terms of um, of this passage I read, this extraordinary passage by Negugi. I like Piongo. that bit about the oxygen. It's that wonderful. That is so, it's, it's summing up the act of translation, which is something that Gugi believes in. You know, I'm sorry to keep bringing you back to this translation thing. Please do. But Please do. <laughs> and, and, and to me, it is oxygen, isn't it? And when it disappears from a certain English language bookshelf, which it did for the last 15, 20 years, and then it came back, you know, in 2005, when Siegel started to play first world publisher and buy world rights for wonderful European translations. I'd like to believe that these 15 years that we've produced 500 books of translated literature, it's made a slight, slight difference to these bookshelves where it had all disappeared because you don't sell enough translations. They don't make enough money. And now it's become a numbers game. And But if you will allow me, I think your listeners may enjoy this little exchange that I had a few days ago with Googie since you please, were talking about please, it. Please, please, please. Because... He's just come out of a multiple bypass. And so I wrote him a little text which went something like this. With nothing left to lose, except, except its silver sheen, the night waits at a courteous distance for us to complete our conversation in utter silence. Will we meet again? Meet perhaps at another removed twilight. And he wrote to me with, with what was like like half an hour of getting this. Dear Naveen, I wish I could write poetry in English so I can tell you of my mother saying, no night is so dark that it will not end in dawn. Or simply put, every night ends with dawn. And in his own language, Gutiri Utuku Utakia, we shall meet again and again and talk about both darkness and dawn, Googie. I thought it was lovely that he um, responded. He's just come out of these multiple bypasses, and he's just, I think, his first few months of accessing the computer and being able to talk. Well, he he wrote back, I mean, it's so tremendously moving, Naveen. He wrote back with a, yes. from, from a place of wisdom, um, from a place of great wisdom, from a place, kind of a, a, a cosmic view rather than just what has happened to me. After night, yeah. there is dawn. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he says in another book called Globalectics, mm -hmm. he says, translation is the language of languages. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of work that you have done. I, I want our listeners to, to know about Siegel Press and to know that you've made these decisions that are not based on selling 100,000 books, but... A decision no, made, no. a decision <laughs> small is beautiful, and it it reminds me um, very much of of a of a of a sentence by Arthur Miller, where he says, mm -hmm. "Don't be seduced into thinking that that which does not make profit is without value." <laughs> Don't be seduced mm -hmm. into thinking that that which does mm. not make profit is without value. Mm. I feel yes. these could be your marching orders, Naveen, and have been. <laughs> or, or my epitaph. No, yeah. but... <laughs> no, let that not happen anytime soon, <laughs> please. Yes. No, no, I understand this. I mean, uh, we've, what can I say? I mean, to me, translation interestingly, is also an act of intimacy. As it's a kind of surrendering, as in completely drowning in the act of reading. Like love, you know? Loving the other text, language, the writing, enough to, to kind of completely immerse yourself in it. Become pliant. There should be no place for the self as ego or personality with its own airy views to be possessed, 
you know what I mean? Yes. By the spirit of that chosen text, language, literature, poetry. That, that is the single-minded devotion that translation brings to the fore. I love the way you, you spoke about translation and nearly as the, the body of the loved one. Yeah. But these are going to be tricky times, let us see. There will be time enough to pick up the pieces after this is abated a little. Is your, is your press still functioning? Are people in... in uh, so we're all working from the house because are. we're not allowed. It's like a, yeah, it's like a curfew and a total lockdown. So, uh, you know, even the simple act of trying to trust for money is a tricky one because you're all at your homes and banks are running skeletal services and you're fretting about people's salaries and that kind of thing. So the next 21 days we're here and I have a feeling it's going to be extended by another month, but we're hoping they'll give us a few days to to get money into people's pockets. That's, that's very important. Well, Naveen, um, it's been a distinct pleasure to speak to you in these very dark times. Leave me with a thought, any thought. Well, I'd leave you with one word beyond compassion. We're going to lead a certain generosity of heart, Paul. There's no getting away from that. And we're going to have to share whatever little we have with others. You know, it's extraordinary that you say that because in my weak conversation, many, many of my interlocutors have spoken about just that. You speak mm -hmm. about generosity. Werner Herzog, the German filmmaker, spoke about kindness. Yes, P kindness, P kindness above all. Pico Aya spoke about kindness and tenderness. Um, you know, the great minds, the minds that I love, that I think we share a love of them, whether it's, uh, yes. whether it's a Pico, whether it's a Jan Morris who believes in the mm. religion of generosity. Um, mm. I think that is what matters, and it matters more and now. Generosity than is not only about people with wealth. It has to be a sacrifice involved in every act of generosity. Naveen, I just can only hope that we see each other soon again. I remember we will indeed. We have plans we for have, February 21. We, we, do, we do, we do, we do. And, and I, I, yes. I'm, I'm very much hoping that they will be, that we will, that it will be possible to carry them out. Yes. In the meantime, please take care of yourself. Please give my love to everybody at Siegel Press. And for those people listening to us now, when, you, when you're looking for a beautiful book, and in these times and in later times, turn your eyes to what Naveen Kishore has built, which is Siegel Press, which is just exquisite books that every time I open them give me a form of tactile inebriation. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Paul. Good night. <laughs>